the chapter we're on is chapter 12, and um, this chapter actually talks about now the Benoni. We left off uh, with chapter 11, kind of discussing the difference between the Rasha Vitovlo and the Rasha Viralo, two of the categories uh, in the Tanya that discusses um, the differences between the different personalities and the different souls that come down on this earth. I guess the person who put on mute, it just doesn't work, so maybe we should try again. Or... Hello? Okay, we'll just continue and see how it goes. Um, so the Bainani actually is the, in one respect, considered the intermediate man, um, between the Rashaim and the Tzaddikim. Back in chapter 1 of Tanya, um, we actually, in, in, in the chapter Tanya 1 CDs that I had uh, produced, talked about this concept of these five different ranking souls, and Benani is not someone who's like half good and half, you know, has moments of weakness and is sinning. The Benani actually is like a tzaddik because he never sins with his thought, speech, and action. Um, and the, in this chapter, we're going to find out what really is the difference between a Benani and a tzaddik because a tzaddik also doesn't sin in thought, speech, and action. The Benani, as uh, Dr. Rebbe speaks about, is one who has not uh, attained enough power to really conquer this animal soul within. And um, he explains that even though he's not committing any transgression in thoughts, in speech, or in action, that the term Russia has never been even applied to him, even not even temporarily, not even for a moment. And the question that he asks is that how is it possible that we learn everyone can get to the level of a you know, uh, you know, to a tzaddik? And um, so why is it considered differently when a person is? you know, wanting and yearning to at least reach the level of a Bainani. So how is it that it, it's never really at all like the term Russia applied to him? So Dr. Rebbe tries to explain that at the moment that he's reached the level of Bainani, then none of his actions, and he never is, you know, um, considered a Russia even for a second, as soon as he, let's say, God forbid, has a urea and moves away from such a high lofty stature, then then and there he leaves the category of Benoni and he's considered, let's say, a Rasha Vitovlo. Um, so in this regard, you know, we learned how the, the tzaddik has such love of Hashem that his his whole being is so filled with this love that not even for a second he desires anything of the Gashmiut that is not L'Shem Shemaim. But the Benoni is different. Even though he's conquering his thoughts, his speech, and his actions, internally he still is waging war. He, he has a delight in his moment of a desire for something in the Gashmiut, but then and there he conquers it and he, he doesn't let it um, be released in any form um, or in any way does he express himself in, his, in, in the ultimate inner desire that he actually has at that moment. So the, the faculties of the animal soul does have some degree over you know some degree of control over his body and it's awakened in the heart and he wants these uh, these worldly pleasures but he realizes that he doesn't want to engage in it he doesn't want to listen to it he fights the battle and he wins um 
only at specific times do his faculties of this divine soul of his hold undisputed sovereignty. Um, and the Altarebbe explains that uh, during the times of the Shema or the Amida, that this time when the supernal intellect, um, you know, that is above, is at that moment during his prayer, and especially in these specific prayers, does it become like revealed. And that the spiritual illumination of these higher spiritual worlds actually is manifest in this in this man's heart. So we learn that you know through the prayers, every man actually has an opportunity to ascend to like a higher spiritual level, and this happens because. The the, the Benoni especially is binding his Chabad, his intellectual faculties, which consist of Chochma, Bina, and Das, to Hashem. Through his meditating deeply on the greatness of Hashem, through arousing through this meditation a burning love of God in his right part of his heart. Remember, the left part of the heart is where the animal soul is. The brain is where the godly soul mostly resides, but the right part of the heart, that's the part of the heart that can develop this love of Hashem and proper Yira Hashem. This love that is activated and revealed and actually created through this Hisbonanus in the Tefillah leads the Benini to desire to cleave to Hashem and works its way through to conquering the, the taivas and the, and the struggle within to be able to fulfill the Torah and its commandments through this love. Because the Benoni realizes that only through the fulfillment of Torah and mitzvahs will this fulfill his, desi- his desire to become one with Hashem and will allow Hashem to have... Uh, you know, channel in within him this love. And this arousal for love of Hashem and this accompanying resolve to adhere to the Torah mitzvahs and actually to more and more cleave to Hashem is really the essential subject of the Shema. Because if you look at the Shema, there are two blessings before one regarding you know the the loftiness of the angels and um and also if you look at any other mitzvah normally what happens when you're about to do a mitzvah the bracha that you say before a mitzvah is ex- is really gearing you up and creating within you this channel to be able to, uh, um, like a clea almost, to be able to channel this energy into uh, into this kli, into your opportunity of connecting to Hashem through this mitzvah. And that's why um, you say, like, for instance, when you're about to... Uh, recite a blessing before a mitzvah, the blessing is usually connected to the actual mitzvah that you're about to do. It actually mentions the particular commandment to be, be to be performed. For instance, it says, thank you God for sanctifying us by commanding us to perform, let's say, nitzilat yadayim, or whether it's tefillin, or whatever mitzvah that you're doing. But in the case of the blessings said before reciting Shema, it's not clear what the the blessings accomplish because it doesn't it doesn't actually seemingly connect because we're not saying thank you for sanctifying us for saying the prayer of Shema. Um, but but if you look at these two blessings before the Shema, it is actually a preparation because what is Shema all about? That would be able to get to that level of loving Hashem. So one, when we consider, look at how great these angels are. And yet, Hashem, you chose us. You chose the Jewish people to be, you know, down here on this earth fulfilling your mission. Um, and the, the, the first actually describes aspects of the greatness of Hashem. You know, look how great these angels are, totally nullified before him. 
He's even as as great as these angels are. They're, he's far removed from them, and he chooses us. And the second one speaks of his great love for the Jewish people, that he draws them close to him. So after a person really contemplates and meditates on these ideas, then the person about to say Shema is preparing himself to really connect to be able to get to the level of loving Hashem. Because as the explanation goes, like how can you command someone to love God? It's like either you feel it or you don't. But the Shema and the contemplation of his oneness and realizing that that through meditating on his greatness, through meditating that he chose us, that we realize, ah, now we can get to the level of of, of loving. It's there, hafta, and you will love if you meditate and, and contemplate these concepts in your tefillah. And this is what the Benoni is, is, is on fire with when he is saying these tefillahs. And we realize that after prayer, though, it's not so easy because the, int- the intellect of the blessed and self is not really in a state of sublimity. It's not totally revealed as it was in- during the tefillah. So that the spiritual illumination engendered by the prayer ceases and the evil of the animal soul, which is in the left part of the heart, reawakens. That's why, like, someone could be so connected to tefillah, having such awesome feelings of delight, and yet close the sitter, and then, you know, the baby comes and, and pulls at your dress, and, and the other child is, like, really, you know, uh, maybe not behaving so beautifully, and the person starts to get nervous and antsy and, and maybe lash out in a way that is shocking to them because it doesn't make, like, a connection. Wait a minute, I felt so close to God. I had such closeness, and yet how come now when the challenge comes, like, I'm losing my strength in, in handling the situation? So the altar is explaining to us this is very normal, that, you know, don't think you're, you know, you're so uh, weak because the closeness that you felt through tefillah is beyond your, you know, even... Will it, it's something that comes as a spiritual energy, as a gift to you through the experience, and of course the Bainuni is who's experiencing it, um, you know, in a lofty manner. And because this part of the animal soul becomes reawakened, then the struggle comes right back down. And for the Bainuni, the struggle's there, and he actually conquers it and doesn't allow it to overcome him, and he doesn't actually behave in a way that he feels like. Um, now, the Alter Rebbe actually explains, well, if the Benoni doesn't have, you know, any sin of thought, speech, or action, it, it doesn't really make sense. How is he struggling? Or how does he have, like, you know, and he explains that these the first thought of this struggle comes and it rises from the heart to his mind are beyond his control. This is the Avoida of the Yetzirah. It comes to an and um, and this nobody, not even you know, the also a a Rashava Rala and Rashava Tolo experience these in, this initial thought. Um, but the Benoni, however, controls his actual conscious and willful thought so that immediately he becomes aware of this forbidden thought and he dismisses it from his mind. He doesn't permit it to uh, to dwell on them or to think about it or to implement what he first thought about. Mm-hmm. And in this way, you know, he is that Gibor. He is that uh, that that strong man that is able to conquer um, uh, the challenge at hand. Um, so the divine soul of the Benini, he's keeping his desires uh, of his animal soul in check. And he says that this happens because the brain rules over the heart. And he actually says, by virtue of his 
its innately created nature. And here, this is where we get a little extra inspiration because we might not be at a, you know, even near that level. But here, Alter is saying, you know, don't worry. Even though you're not even a Bainini, that there's this concept called the brain rules over the heart. Because he says that the man was created from birth, that every person, every person has the power of the will in his brain to restrain himself and control the drive of his heart's lust, preventing his heart's desires from finding expression in deed, word, and thought. When the mind understands the evil inherent in such a deed, or word or thought, he can divert its attention completely from that which his heart is is craving. And he can actually turn his attention to the exact opposite direction. The principle of mind over heart holds true even where the restraint of one's desire is really just dictated by logic, simple logic, not, you know, any kind of philosophical logic, without even motives of holiness. The demands of the mind's logics are alone sufficiently powerful to steer one's attention in directions that are diametrically opposite to that which the heart craves. I mean, a simple example is like you go to work and, uh, and you're a teacher, and somehow in the school like you have more control over the way you react to a child's behavior. And it's logic. Wow, if I don't behave in this situation, I'll lose my job. I need the pranasa. I need to pay my children's tuition. I need food on the table, whatever. Come home, and all of a sudden, you know, whether it's in the morning or in the evening, sometimes you find yourself, like, not having that control because no one's going to take your job away from you as a mother. So the logic is not there in in giving you the strength to, you know, to, to change you so that, that, that you actually have that control. Um, and this is very fascinating because today there are so many DVD and books out there. It's like amazing. Uh, I don't know some of the clients that I work with tell me, and I have to get a hold of them just to see, you know, because uh, you know, there's uh, secrets and down the rabbit hole and all these books telling us the power of our thoughts and how that we have uh, the brain has such amazing power also power in healing so many books out there um and if this is true regarding our mind's power over our heart um then how much more so when the motives are particularly in the direction of holiness the rebbe um Previous Rebbe in his Lukute de Burim talks about his father who went to a doctor and was like really, I think we mentioned this in previously in one of the classes, like, let me see, what's your regimen about? And he was just like saying that uh, he studied Hasidus. So the doctor says, okay, tell me what does this studying Hasidus entail? And he says, basically training your brain to rule over your heart. The doctor says, well, my gosh, no wonder you're, like, not well. Like, stop it. It's, it's going to drive you crazy. You're going to, you know, you have to realize it's it's impossible. They're, like, in two vast oceans with an island in between. And he says, no, no, no. The brain is equipped and as well as the heart to be able to create a wiring system so that there will be mastery over the heart. And even though by natural instincts we, we study that, that uh, we actually think yeah, we actually act three to four times faster than we think. But we have it within our power to train ourselves to slow down our reactions by using the power of our brain. And the more we use the power of our brain, the more we succeed. And then the Alter Rebbe brings out from Kohelis, Then I saw the, that wisdom surpasses folly as light surpasses darkness. And really, that's a simple statement. What's why such a what's in this for us? Like, and he says actually that wisdom is superior to falling. The superiority of light over darkness is manifest in the ability of a tiny little ray of light to banish a great deal of darkness. The light doesn't battle the darkness; it just it just banishes as it appears. It's a matter of course as the light appears. So in the same way, wisdom of holiness 
is superior to the folly of evil. Just a mere ray of holiness suffices to banish, as a matter of course, a great deal of folly. So this is, you know, the the, the power of such little effort, barely any effort of this light. So the same thing, much foolishness of the klipa, the sitra akhra, of the animal soul, which is in the left heart, um, is banished as more holiness is brought in through our contemplation and our studies and, and, and sharpening those brain muscles with the wisdom that Hashem gave to us. And we know that a man does not sin unless a spirit of folly enters him. Ruach Stutt. And when you have the mitzvahs in front of you, and especially your Torah learning, it shields you from this this spirit of folly so that your mind doesn't get so confused and doesn't get captured by the animal soul. Because we realize that there are so many um, avenues to be able to conquer this challenge. We have the ahavas misuteris, which is inside of our heart, willing and ready to just be exposed through through our prayers and through our mitzvahs that we do. We have moichin shalet alev, the brain is able to overcome the heart's negative passions. We have this idea of light dispelling darkness. We have ahava sikhli, that the more we learn and meditate on Hashem's greatness, the more our brain can actually develop a new love of Hashem, like a created passionate love towards Hashem, beyond even the Ahava Mesuteris. We have our prayers that give us uh, an impact on our soul that allows the Moichin uh, Gatlus to just like planted seeds in us while we're davening. We have Hashem's power. We have also being bittel. Bittel also helps us in this endeavor. The more we humble ourselves before God, the more we are able to create a space for Hashem to dwell in us so this light can be able to penetrate and remove this darkness. Because really, the Benoni is our example of this lofty level. And the Alter Rebbe in Tanya says that every person can reach the level of a Benini. And Hayom Yom, in one of the Hayom Yoms, it actually says that not only can we reach the level so that the Gashmiot and the physical Taivas and everything out there are, are, are in the world, that we really can reach a level where it won't affect but also, we must, <laughs> because a lot of people think, like, oh, this is for tzaddikim, oh, get to level level, oh, you know, it's, it's a wild dream, you know, dream on, as they say. But no, the Rebbe is saying that not only can we, we must. So, so here we go, and the Alter Rebbe says that the essence and core of the divine soul in the Benoni, does not dominate the essence and the core of the animal soul. And that's the difference between a Benoni and a Tzaddik. A Tzaddik has that dominion. And um, he continues and he says that the when you when you think about um, the different ways a Benoni, you know, uses his this lofty stature of his one ben adam le hashem like in how he like longs to do the mitzvahs he uses this fiery energy to like be excited and have kavana and 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 but also he uses this in his relationship ben adam le chavero and um and he says um that there's three sins 
that are so difficult to avoid that no man is safe from transgressing them daily. He says, thoughts of sin, lack of concentration in prayer, and slanderous gossip. And and he says that the Benini is included in this generalization that no man avoids this. It's just it's very very difficult. But of, and he says that when a person has this impression from this meditation that he does in his davening, it's retained in his mind so that. Hashem's greatness and this natural love and fear of Hashem that's hidden in the right part of his heart actually then enable him to prevail over and dominate these cravings of the animal soul and he actually prevents the this this evil you know from get, gaining the supremacy and the dominance over himself and he doesn't carry through And what he will do is, upon these thoughts coming to him, he actually, um, even though it rises to his mind, he just thrusts it aside as if with both of his hands and averts his mind from it. He refuses to accept it even as a subject for mere conscious thought and will certainly not entertain the notion of acting on it, God forbid. Because he doesn't want, God forbid, to be you know, labeled a Russia at that moment. So um, when we focus our attention on this, this, this lofty service between man and his fellow man, we realize that mainly what is it we're trying to do when these thoughts are coming to us? Basically to handle the circumstance and act in such a beautiful way with kindness, with patience, with love, and there is a actual uh, book called Kindness by uh, that was written by Rabbi Pliskin, and it was very. Uh, the question he gives is, "What kind of a person are you?" With each action you take, and with every word you say, you answer an important question: What kind of person are you? Are you a giver or a taker? All takers must give and all givers must take, but there is a basic pattern of giving and a basic pattern of taking. A giver thinks about what he can do for others. He takes in order to give. A taker thinks about what others can do for him. Even when he gives, it's only because he wants to take eventually. By increasing your giving, you become more of a giver. Are you a person who loves to do acts of kindness? Your answer this by the way you react when people ask you to do things for them. Are you pleased to have opportunities to help others? Or do you resent people bothering you? The more you increase your sense of joy for doing even the little things for others, the more you become a lover and kinder person. As you respond compassionately to the plight of others, you become a compassionate person. Ignoring the plight of another gives a very different answer to the question, what kind of person are you? When you go beyond the ordinary to do major things for another human being, you create an extraordinary person. There is no limit to the heights to which you can elevate yourself. When you spend time thinking of creating ways to help others, your creativity is a work of art. And there are many forms of created artistry. The form that elevates you the most is creative kindness. You look for ways to help people who need help but are reluctant to take anything even the time from others. You find creative ways to cheer up the despondent, to help people overcome their obstacles, and to make peace between people who quarrel. As you creatively find answers to people's problems, the person you become is an elevated, creative artist. You are creating a better life for a fellow human being. What kind of person do you really want to be? And when you are kind and giving, you create a better you. And it's interesting, the same person that gave me this book gave me also another book that also had a very beautiful message on kindness. And it takes us back to the time in the city of Garav that was um, not far from Shiloh. And there was this, uh, the book is called Footsteps of the Prophets. It talks about Micha who actually, um, you know, was 
a baby that was stuck in the mortar, you know, back in the Egyptian slavery. And Moshe was like, wait, help this baby. And Hashem was saying, um, you know, uh, they are getting rid of the thorns. And, um, and this baby actually, God knew, was going to be trouble in the future. But Moshe, I guess, uh, um, you know, prayed for this baby and he got saved. And Hashem said, uh, see for yourself. And so Moshe actually took a small tablet and inscribed Hashem's name on it. And he placed it on Micha and he revived him and taking him out of the wall. And in later years, Hashem's judgment actually was proven right because when Micha grew up, he started making idols in Egypt and then in the desert, he's the one who wanted to make the golden calf and he actually took this inscription and threw it on the fire and actually made the, the golden calf. And during the time of the judges, when there was uh, this time period, uh, he was actually, he created his own sanctuary and built an idol, and the angels were getting really fed up and said, well, what's going on here? Um, <clears throat> and they said, how can you remain silent from the smoke of Micha's abominations that's mingling with the holy smoke rising from your own altar? Um, and Hashem said, no, 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 don't touch him. It's true that they're offering idols there from the, you know, but the smoke brings benefit to the world because Yonasan also was, one of the great leaders, was also going and and, and worshipping these idols there. Um, and he said, you know, this smoke actually, you know, when you look up in the sky and you see this pillar of smoke spiraling up, many people get lost in the wilderness and this smoke actually helps them find their way. And they give them the strength to head toward to come out alive when they're lost. And Micha's temple, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of kindness in this place. So many people are being fed and, and, and given to drink. And, um, and you know, he says, hold on, hold on, wait. You know, leave Micha's statue be. Let this be a landmark for the wandering and the lost travelers. And let it also be a lesson to you on how highly I regard the mitzvah of tzedakah and kindness. So the message here is like, you know, many times we're like, oh, we forget to do that bracha with really kavana, and we, we should have done this and we didn't do that. And like when we do just that extra measure of kindness, let's see how far it goes and how Hashem like is so ever like, you know, forgiving to us for all of the good things that we're doing and the, that we can have some source of release of our tension of uh, and and knowing that when we do that kindness to our loved ones the power it has on um and how Hashem loves us uh, regarding also this concept of having difficulties in our speech I was just um, also looking at this uh, CD about uh, the beauty of the way Hashem made the, our body work. And, you know, as the Rambam says, the more you, like, have his bonus on the greatness of Hashem, even within your own, whatever's working within you, it just brings such um, such greater love of Hashem and the greater love of Hashem then gives you that extra strength to like really overpower the the negative within you but one of the concepts that uh, were brought upon was this idea of a ishan is like the word for pupil you know when it was talking about the eyes and it explained that any time in the torah it, any word that had the vav and nun sofit on the bottom made it the, the word be little of that something so ishan is really a little man and the reason why um hashem chose this word ishan for for to to give the wording of this pupil you know the eye uh, is to teach us a lesson that when you look into some other person and you're looking in them in the eye, if you take a close look, you see actually a little eye yourself. You see a little man, and that is yourself. And to remind us, 
when you're dealing with other people, work on humbling yourself. Don't be so arrogant. Don't be so feeling, you know, powerful over them. Just like see yourself as this little man, humble yourself, and, and through that you'll be able to connect to them from eye to eye. And really the two eyes in our face is actually, um, you know, one eye is to be able to look favorably at another to look at Hashem and, and where how lofty and how great Hashem is. And the other is to realize we have yet to reach the level of Hashem's glory and, 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 and His attributes of kindness and of, of, of sweetness and, and chesed and rachamim. We also know that um, when we view the people, you know, in this way by humbling ourselves before them, we actually have um a greater strength about us to be in that position to restrain the things that we say to them. There's this concept called karpas, you know, in the Haggadah we take the karpas and we dip it into the salt water. And really, bitzel comes from the word lidbol, like to sink in. Like when you sink in and you dip in this karpas into this bowl, that um, through this bitterness of where you really, this moment of bitterness of like I really can be much better than I have been, you can get to the level of Klau Rishon Pesatum, which is the four letters of Karpas. The you know, like the first rule is like keep your mouth shut when you when you realize you're losing your bitum, when you realize, oh my gosh, I'm feeling like really angry, this bothered me, I I I, I can't believe this, I, I and you feel like saying something, you just remind yourself, like right now I'm not in the state to be able to say properly what I want to say because I feel my emotions overtaking me. I'm not humbled before this person right now, and then comes. Yachatz and Magid, actually, even though it's not Pesach, but like the concept is, is then when you're really ready to then say something, you've overcome your emotions and you feel like now I can better say what I have to say. Cut in half what you want to say. Yachatz meaning break in half, and Magid what you're about to say because really the less the better. <laughs> Because sometimes when you say too much, it just it's so easy to go far away from the the intent that you had um, in the first place. So um, the Alter Rebbe actually says that with this relationship between man and his fellow, the Benoni does not grant expression in thought, speech, or action to any evil feelings toward his fellow. As soon as there rises from his heart to, to, or to his mind any animosity or hatred, God forbid, jealousy, anger, or grudge, or the like, he will bar them from his mind and will. And, and in fact, on the contrary, his mind will prevail over and dominate the feelings of his heart, exactly to the opposite emotion, and to conduct himself toward his fellow with a quality of kindness, you know, instead of severity. And he will display toward his fellow a disproportionate love in suffering from him to the furthest extreme without being provoked into anger, God forbid. And he will then even repay his offenders with favors, as we are taught in the Zohar that, you know, that we should learn from the example of Yosef's conduct with his brothers, how he repaid them with, even for the suffering that he, they brought upon him, and he gave them kindness and favors. And, um, you know, and so we understand in this chapter that this Benini is really a master over his thoughts, speech, and action. And um, he just completely acts accordance with the Torah mitzvahs. But his essence, his intellect, and his emotions... Um, 
he has another master as well. The animal soul is still in force. It is still a struggle for him, and it is still powerful, and yet he is able to overcome it. Um, and we realize that, um, uh, Alter Rebbe explains that when a Jew studies Torah, he feels like a student before Hashem, his teacher, and and whose wisdom he's studying. But really, when a, when, and he reminds us that when we pray, that he really feels like a child before his father. We have to realize like so many times in our life where we're just yearning and longing to be that more gracious, loving, patient individual and, and you know, yearning to have just that peace of mind and that inner happiness and everything about us to, like, be of service to Hashem. But the more we realize, look at this, a Benini. He's such a high level. He has this struggle. Like, we can't expect that we're not going to have the struggle. We can't expect that overnight it's just going to be a piece of cake to serve Hashem with such 100% uh, freedom uh, from these negative feelings. But what we do know is that we already have the cure for this kind of, you know, uh, we learned that whatever disease is out there in the world, Hashem already has implanted the the cure from from the start. So even though He planted this animal soul in us, that He already gave us the cure of how to get out of it, you know, step by step, slowly but surely. And um, even if it takes us till our, you know, uh, you know, a little longer than we actually want, but the more we're at peace with that, the more we free ourselves, you know, and are able to get closer and closer to that greater reality. One time, Rabbi Jacobson, in a, a lecture that he gave, I think it was for Nesheikh Chabad, I was there, and he was. it was actually the weekend his father passed away, and uh, he was saying, like, he so much didn't, you know, it was like in the midst of his shiva, really, and it happened to be on Shabbos, but he, he knew his father would want him to put his own, like, pain and suffering aside and do this lesson, and so he dedicated it to his father. It was amazing. And one of the main lessons that I just uh, it just stuck with me, he tells of the story of his father that as he was uh, really in the hospital, in and out in his last days, you know, was so involved with kindness, uh, making sure people would hear the shofar in, in the neighboring rooms and, and, and making sure that they would have information and talking and, and making a difference in the lives of the patients around him. And people were, you know, some here and there were saying to him, like, it's your dying days, like, you know, take it easy, like, you know, you need to take care of yourself. And... Rabbi Jacobson so beautifully gave an example of um, what his father brought over to him, and he said, "Look, there, there's, there's really three types of fools in the world. One, as soon as they open the door and walk in the room, the way they are speaking, you can tell they're, they're just." They're, they're foolish. They they they're not wise, and they just they just by their speaking, you know, um, give themselves away that they they really don't have it together. Another person, you know, comes into the door, and um, you know is dressed nicely and is a smooth talker, and it's like amazing. No one could tell. Um, that he's, you know, doesn't, nothing gives him away. Not his dress, not the way he speaks. Actually, that's the second one. And the third person, actually, you know, is, you know, you can't tell by the way he speaks, the way he dresses, that he's a smooth talker, and, and but when he leaves the room, he slams the door and it gives it away that he's like, he, that, that he really is, you know, not the master of his emotions like we would want to think, and um, and and his father said, "Look, I'm about to leave this world. 
I don't want to slam the door. I want to leave this world the way I've been, you know, all my life, you know, trying to do the goodness in the world that I have. And these are my last moments to make that impression to Hashem. I don't want to slam it. So when we think about the day-to-day challenges, you know, to make that commitment to really be that more particular about the way we speak, the way we dress, so that we aren't slamming that door, you know, and 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 making the the best use of 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 everything that's out there the the torah knowledge our praying our his bonanus to allow this energy to come to us to give us that extra energy to overcome the battle we might not overcome it completely on all thought speech and action but to increase our percentage of benuni like behaviors in fact, the author Rebbe says that, you know, you should take moments and really contemplate what is it to be a tzaddik. And, and the more you actually have like this contemplation of how the tzaddik just loves Torah and mitzvahs and how he hates the, the desires of the world and how he, he's so bitter and he has no ego flaring up and getting in his way in his relationships, that the more you think like that, even for moments, like and, and envision yourself that way, the more you have it become more second nature to you. So the same thing, like, you know, regarding our thoughts, speech, and actions and wanting more bainani like moments in the day. That, and, and more than that, you know, not even have a struggle within and just really feel the delight in serving Hashem. And finally, there is one more story that I want to bring out. And um, this is a story that was brought out on our Shabbos table regarding uh, the Baal Shem Tov and one of his disciples who happened to do his shlichos and come into a new community. And he was like really interested in to see how this town function and he noticed really that there wasn't that many uh, organizations of chesed or feeding the poor or you know and he was concerned about that and he decided to find out what's going on and and he noticed that most of the monies of the community were being directed to the rabbi to sustain the rabbi's household uh, debts and 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 he just was concerned that, you know, some of the money should be allocated to more chesed organizations. So he began to convince people, and then a lot of time came that he got the monies and started the organizations. But at the same time, the rabbi now, who was so used to, you know, having these sons, got very distraught and was crying to Hashem, I can't feed my children anymore like I used to. I, I can't do my job and worry about Parnassah. And, and the tears actually went up to Shemaim and, and, they, and the tears were heard. And what happened was there was a, a gazera of a sort toward and against this chassid because he so carelessly took away money from this rabbi and um and a consequence of that carelessness he actually um was going to lose his faith lo and behold the shabbos comes and bear with me on this story till the end because there's just so many incredible lessons from this that we're going to glean from that he all of a sudden in felt like he didn't want to go to show. Wow, Kiddish, he's not going to say Kiddish. And he started eating, and all of a sudden, like one thing led to the next. And at that moment, he, on Shabbos, said, I don't want to be a Jew anymore. And he ended up going to the Poritz, uh, the landowner uh, nearby, and, and said, take me to the church. I want to renounce my Judaism, and I want to become an apostate. And uh, they get to the place, and... Lo and behold, the Baal Shem Tov feels and senses some doom happening to one of his Hasidim, and he's like, he de- decides to go into a devacus de- and, and, and go internally into the higher spheres to find out what's going on. 
going into the chambers, nobody's telling him. Finally, he reaches the highest level, and it is told that his chassid is losing his faith because of the whole scenario of him being so careless about, uh, you know, um, the rabbi's uh, you know, lack of funds at the moment from his uh, lack of care and concern. And so the Baal Shem Tov is like, oh my gosh, no, no, it can't be. He's such a chassid. He meant it for the good. I have to intervene. What? I, and, and he begs and finally gets, you know, the blessing that, that if this chassid does the uh, Malava Malka, that um, he will be saved from his, his lack of faith in Hashem. So right, Moshe Shabbat comes, the Baal Shem Tov tells one of his chassid, take these uh, horse and chariots and, and go. Go to do a Malava Maka where the horse takes you. So this chassid does what the Baal Shem Tov says, and the, the horses take him to this, the, the priest's, you know, uh, uh, church, and he's like, what is it, here? I, I don't understand. He's like, okay, the Baal Shem Tov said, wherever it takes me. He knocks on the door, and then lo and behold, he sees the chassid on the side about to give over his faith. He goes, wait, 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 and he, he he says, please, I have to talk to this Jew, and he makes his way in, and he like talks to him, and he says, please, please, do a malaba maka, and the guy's drunk. He doesn't care. He's like, no, but by pestering him enough and and the chassid wanting to, I guess, get him off his back maybe, you know, decides to go and do this Malava Malka. And then all of a sudden he wakes up and he's like, wow, what am I doing here? And he just like wakes up from his slumber and they both leave and he has his faith back. So we see like, even when we want to do kindness of some sort, like we have to be very extra careful to see what are the ramifications of this? How many times do we do such kindness for outside people and out, the outside world and 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 we don't really pay attention is this like a kind of somewhat neglect on our own children or is it somewhat you know not so pleasant for our husbands or you know whatever it is and and um you know we have to like really search through all the consequences of this kindness Secondly, another most very amazing idea is this idea that lose your faith for such a thing. Like, you know, Lo and Lena, we know people that were like, how do they do it? How do they get so far from it? What's going on? It's like we see how, like, an, one act, God forbid, like, not that we should be so paranoid, but that sometimes losing our faith is beyond our control, and not our control, but like beyond their control that we're seeing in someone. That they that if we just get them to do one more mitzvah or, or some other deed to like break through the barriers of of of, of such uh, a state of being, and really this concept of malava malka, you would think, okay, what is this malava malka? That had the power to like get his faith back. Well, what is a malava malka? Malava malka is something we're not commanded really to do. We're we're malave. We're a, a, like um, accompanying this Shabbos queen out, you know, so we don't just say goodbye. We like escort her in a dignified way by having a meal and, you know, and this is something that is pleasant for Hashem. This is not a command. And we learn in many different places that like when you go the extra mile to please Hashem, especially even when it's not a commandment, and go beyond the measure, how much power that is in your relationship to Hashem. Because one might think, oh, I had enough food, I can't bear to eat another uh, like minute form of food. I had even my 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 fill of ruchnius of my spirituality i had dvar torahs i learned i daven i gotta get to the real life and you know i have this to do i have that to do you know i have all these deadlines to do so like when you take away your will and say "Ah, even though i have so much to do and i know this will be pleasing to hashem and you make that extra effort how powerful that is in the eyes of hashem and what kindness it does for your soul when you relate to God in such a higher level. May we all be blessed to be able to just go from strength to strength, have more Benoni-like moments as well as Tzadik-like moments. 
so that we be that lofty person having that mastery over our emotions. And so now we will have a kavana to give tzedakah and hopefully more checks will come my way at 640 Eastern Parkway, Unit 4C, Brooklyn, New York, 11213. Uh, and checks are tax deductible, to written out to SANE, S-A-N-E, a nonprofit organization bringing soulful advice for new existence, uh, as well as proceeds of uh, going to Eretz HaKodesh, feeding the poor and needy. Okay, we'll get in a comfortable position. And we're going to have a beautiful his bonanus on living a life more and more like the Benini, reaching higher and higher levels, God willing, to more and more Benini and tzaddik like moments. Hear the music, help it relax you, and take that deep breath. And with every breath you take, you really just let it go. The stress of the day, the things that need to be done, all out. Now is your time. Re time to recharge, to invigorate, to refocus your attention on the energies that you need to overcome the day to day battles. We'll do some exercises as we inhale and exhale. We breathe in everything that is good. Peace, tranquility, and patience. Patience with what will be unfolding before our very eyes as we invest the time to really recharge ourselves in this way. We're going to now take our hands and make a fist and a count of three, just release the tension that has accumulated in that part of the body. One, two, three, and slowly let go and release the tension. Now focus on your toe muscles. Crunch them up. Curl them. One, Two and three and let go and release. Take a deep breath. Hold it. And now crunch up your stomach muscles by putting your head forward, reminding you of that humble position, wanting more and more of God's will to be your will making room for him through your humbling yourself. One, two, three. Let go of the tension in your stomach, lifting up your head back to its upright position. And now move your head to the right and to the left and a half a circle to the right and a half a circle to the left back to the center and focus on all your facial muscles. Curl your lips, tighten them, your nose, your forehead, cheeks, one, two, three, and let go. And feel soft and light and comfortable, feeling less the weight of your body and more in tune with the internal kaychas that Hashem has bestowed upon you, coming directly from your neshama. You 
see a beautiful white cloud, and that cloud actually invites you to take a journey to reconnect to that most lofty soul, the Neshama. You see yourself reaching higher and higher heights as the cloud takes you to the most beautiful place. You are in Yerushalayim, Ir Hakdushah. You pick a place, a place that helps you really be connected to your neshama. Maybe you're standing by the kotel, so close to where the Shrina rests in the Holy of Holies. And you begin to have heart warm feelings connecting your desire of wanting to be at the level at least of the Benoni, more and more like him. And you think, where can you upgrade your level of existence in your thoughts, speech, or actions? Where would you like the power of your godly soul to really overcome the battle within. You realize you have so many tools at hand. Just logic alone will give your neshama the power to control your emotions. Moach sholet ahalev. But it is even beyond just logic. From pure, holy intent, your desire is so great. You realize the more you contemplate on the greatness of Hashem through your prayers, through your learning, this light of Hashem just dispels much darkness. There's not even a battle. It just is a consequence of this light coming, penetrating deep within you. Not only does this bring about the Ahavas Mesoteris buried deep within, but it creates a lively love, the Ahava Sikhli. Ahava b'tal nugim, more and more delighting in Hashem. That you see this light coming to you, and it is growing in its measure. And it is dispelling the darkness, the negative side, the negative attributes. And you see yourself just the way you want to be. And you remember humbling yourself before Hashem, reminding yourself that when you make room for Hashem, there is more space for His essence and light to dwell upon you. And the light just keeps growing, keeps coming. And you sense this light coming into your brain, down your heart, the right side, giving birth to such beautiful love, and pushing its way through to the left side. 
and you see the light dispelling the darkness. You feel illuminated, invigorated with this vision of you now, even beyond the Benoni. The struggle is not there as it was yesterday. Revel in this beauty about the possibilities. you're yearning and longing to hold this vision so it will become second nature to you. You see the walls of the Kotel. You touch the stone. You feel that connected to your feelings. That the light is there. The yearning is growing. Your prayers are ascending, reaching the heavens above. And you begin to walk backwards. not even for a second, losing sight of that vision, slowly taking steps back. But that vision is always within you. You see the cloud and then, and that's a reminder, now is the time to bring this vision to reality. You have the power of your thoughts, your speech, and your actions. You feel the sense of your arms, loving arms, reaching out, soft, gentle hands, magical, and your feet touching the ground, giving you that extra strength to go forward, this vision is giving you that strength. Your heart at ease, because every time you pick up that sitter, you receive this amazing supernal energy giving you that greater strength to develop your moichim from the supernal moichim. And you're smiling because now you're one step closer to that reality. And when you open your eyes, you sense you are a brand new you, a more elevated, lofty individual with greater strength to control your thoughts, speech, and actions more and more like a Benoni and more and more even like a Tzaddik. May Hashem bless all of you all of Am Yisrael, that with every act of kindness, bringing us that much closer to the ultimate Geula, Techev Omiyad Mamesh, with Mashiach Sidkenu, leading us to that holy city of Yerushalayim, never to be separated ever again. Remember, keep shining by smiling.
next week we're actually going to be talking about the power of tefillah and his bonanus, an in-depth study on how to extract the most spiritual nutrients from your davening experience. And then we'll get back to Tanya. If anybody is left on the line, we have discussion. Hello, I am. Hi. I know, thank you very much. I must must uh, go oh. now. Thank you. I'm, can I get? Uh, I'm gonna hang up. Yes. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.